this is about job postings and patents. And I'll largely talk about a paper with Nick on, on that subject. Um, so the idea is to construct text-based measures of exposure to specific disruptive technologies at the firm patent and job level uh, going back to 2002, and then to use these novel data to study the spread of new technologies across firms, regions, occupations, and skill levels. So you'll see like a lot of the stuff that we're uh, doing here is using the fact that text can be used to generate multi-dimensional data and then aggregating it into interesting, in interesting ways. Um, okay, so I need to... Okay, so th this paper is after uh, measuring the development and spread of disruptive technologies that are key to economic growth, inequality, entrepreneurship, and firm dynamics. Lots and lots of questions that we deal with as economists really hinge on how does technical, technological progress transmit itself? Um, so for example, when you think about inequality, one question is, does new technology generate jobs only for college grads? And that's a very important question because if the answer is yes, then really we probably need to do something. Uh, if the answer is no, then you know there's hope that people with low skills also benefit from technical progress. Politicians in kind of you know towns throughout the world are trying to generate the next Silicon Valley. One research question is, is that a good idea? And what, what does it buy you? So uh, what we do in this project is we develop a text-based methodology to determine which new technologies affect businesses, uh, and then trace the spread of these uh, new technologies to the locations and firms where they emerge and track their diffusion through regions, occupations, and industries over time. Um, this is kind of an ongoing project. So I'm just going to give you like five preliminary insights from this. The first is that the development and initial employment in disruptive technologies is geographically very highly concentrated. So we know that like research activity is very highly concentrated. And if you go and look at like where does the research happen that then later generates disruptive technologies that change the way that businesses operate, that's even more concentrated than research itself. And around where Nick sits, there's a lot of it. Uh, the second kind of big status fact is that over time, hiring associated with new technologies gradually spreads across space. Um, and over time, again, the skill level and technology jobs declines sharply. So we call this skill broadening. So uh, the way to think about this is that it does seem that technologies, new tech, the use of new technologies, uh, new disruptive technology does trickle down the skill ladder. So even people without college degrees do use new technologies uh, uh, over time. Um, the, the, the kind of maybe unfortunate fact about this is that low skill jobs associated with a given technology spread out from where they were invented significantly faster than high skill jobs. So that means that the places where the new disruptive technologies are invented retain an advantage in high skill hiring for a long uh, period of time. Okay, so let me kind of focus here on the measuring part because this is why you guys are here. You wanna learn the methods. Uh, and then I'm gonna go briefly through like the main findings uh, of that paper. And I think it's kind of interesting mainly because it's kind of like, again, it's multi-dimensional nature. And I'm sure there's gonna be many, many papers that use this text-based data in this sort of multi-dimensional way. So um, we're gonna be ambitious and use full text from three big sources here. And you kind of want a big computer under your desk to facilitate this. So number one is we're going to have the full text of all patents from USPTO patents from 1976. Uh, we're going to have the earnings call transcripts that I've already talked about. And then the new thing is we're going to have the full text of 200 million online job postings from Burning Glass. Now, I'm sure you guys have seen a lot of kind of papers about using Burning Glass data already. Um, that's kind of all the rage and macro at the moment. Most of those papers use um, the, 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 uh, basically the data that Burning Glass coded from that, from those job postings. Um, what we're going to be using is the full text, the full underlying text, and that's been used much less uh, so far. So uh, for each job posting, we know where the job is uh, and which occupation the job is in, and I'm going to use that in various ways. 
All right. So kind of let me give you your step one. So step one is we first need to define what, like basically what is the technology? So I'm gonna kind of use like a text-based way of doing this. So step one is we're gonna identify biograms and I'm gonna go technical biograms from patents. So uh, we're gonna identify two word combinations that are indicative of discussion of new technologies. The way we're gonna do this is we're gonna extract all 17 million two word combinations that we can find in US patents since 1976. And then this is kind of a fun trick. You wanna go like there's 17 million of these, okay? You don't wanna deal with 17 million. So how do you reduce dimensionality here? We're gonna remove any biograms that were in common use prior to 1970. So there's this beautiful thing called the Corpus of Historical American English, which is basically just linguists kind of collecting all kinds of texts, newspaper articles, speeches, people buying coffee and so forth for each year. Cut that off in 1970 and remove all the two word combinations that kind of existed in 1970 from the US patent text. And then you're going to end with 35,000 what we call technical biograms. And we're actually going to use only those that kind of appear in tap patents that are highly cited. And so 35,000 is still a lot. But the All idea right, can I ask, yeah. ask you a question? Why do you cut it off in the corpus of historical American English? Why do you cut it off at 1970? Is that just, would, wouldn't we run out of interest? If we had it up to 2010, we'd use it. It's just we don't have it again. No, I think the idea is to is to cut off before the 19. Well, I guess like we're giving any. So by doing this, is you're giving any invention that happened since 1970 a chance, basically. That's how I think about it. So you're kind of you're removing anything that exists. So you're literally removing anything that existed in 1970. You could go up to 1980 or 2000, but if you went up to you know 2020, you would end up with nothing. But you're right, we could go up to like 2002 or something. But oh, so that's why words like climate change show up because they're now common language, but they wouldn't be show up in 1970. Okay, thanks. Um, so here, so okay, step two is we're now going to take our 35,000 two word combinations from influential patents that are kind of new to patents since 1976 and identify and then cross-reference that with the earnings conference calls. And now we want to know which patent related language is then also used a lot by firm executives and investors when they talk about the firm. And the idea is that this step is going to, is going to isolate what we call disruptive technology. So disruptive technologies that change in some way, the way that firms operate um, in, in particular, to, to make sure that I get firms that I, I, I find uh, innovations that change the way that firms operate, I'm going to look, I'm going to keep only two word combinations that have like an increase in frequency during our sample, at least tenfold. Yeah, so uh, those, the top ones of these, I'll have a look at them. This is kind of fun. Mobile devices, machine learning, cloud computing are the top three. And the top three, what we call the top three biographs with uh, which are uh, uh, associated with disruptive technologies. Interestingly, out of our 35,000, now we end up with only with 305. And this seems pretty robust. There's not all that many two word combinations that come from patents and then explode in their use in firm language. Yeah, so even if you kind of change this threshold around, you're going to get maybe 270 or 360, but not that much more. And so you really kind of reduce by two orders of magnitude by looking at which innovations end up changing business. All right, so uh, let me kind of like go through this a little bit quickly. So I'm now gonna measure technology exposure at the, at the patent earnings call and job level by just looking at does the two word combination, uh, uh, sorry, I should say, you have these 305 biograms, we're not gonna group them into technologies. Yeah, acknowledging that like mobile devices, smartphone, tablet, and Android phones are all kind of like the same, like talking about the same technology, which we define kind of, this kind of like a lot of steps, but you know, uh, just think about, we're drawing circles around the 305 biograms and figuring out which, uh, uh, which are which technology. Uh, Agustin? Um, hi, I have a kind of a silly question on the, on the biograms that you showed before the list. Yes. So the word cloud service and cloud services, 
appears in the list. Yes. So, so is that kind of a problem for the metrics what you're using and how you identify whether it's a plural or a singular word? No, there's a very easy way. This is like a one line in your, there's like a Python package that will allow you to include plural and singular of all words. Uh, and obviously, so we're, yes, we allow that. Um, so you're right, that's, so that happens here. Let me kind of talk a little bit more about like, sorry, I guess this should be about methods. So let me kind of just spend time on the methods. So um, it's actually kind of a tricky question of like grouping these 305 biograms into technologies. Uh, so we did a lot of kind of manual work on this. Um, part of this is, is if you have like a group that you want to group into a technology like these mobile devices, smartphone, tablet, Android phones, you can use a technique called embedding vectors, and particularly you can train embedding vectors on embedding vectors. Basically, uh, recognize it's like you can think of this as like an eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition of the you know bigram space. And what it does is it basically finds you two-word combinations that are often used in conjunction or as synonyms for the two-word combinations that you feed into it. So there's kind of a, a smart Python package where you can say, here's, my, here's the text I want to train you on. In this text, if you, if you hear mobile devices, smartphone, tablet, or Android phone, what are the top synonyms for these? And so if, you wanna, if you're worried about, fault, about uh, uh, kind of missing uh, technical biograms, that's a way of addressing false negatives. Uh, similarly, false positives, you can address by just reading the damn thing. And seeing, you know, how often does mobile devices actually refer to a band as opposed to like a, a gadget? Does that make sense? So we described this a lot in the paper. I don't want to spend too much time. I actually, don't I have no idea how much time I have. So, okay. Um, all right. So now, uh, now we have our definition of each uh, technology. We actually ended up with twenty-nine of them, but you could make more or less if you wanted to. Um, and now we want to measure uh, the exposure of each job to each technology at each point in time. So when there's a job posting and it says something about mobile devices, then we say, aha, it has something to do with smart devices, this job. Uh, in fact, okay. So here's an example. Here's a job posting where they talk about as a member of the digital entertainment business unit, you will play a key role in the development of testing and validation new chips in the growing smart TV market. So this is an example of a job posting that mentions smart TVs because you're producing the smart TVs. Similarly, there's going to be other job postings that talk about use of the smart device in your job. Use, use third channel technology on a smart device to collect crucial data and engage with consumers. So this is for a sales representative. So this is the same technology. One job posting is about producing it. The other one is about using it. And in fact, if you look at mentions of these technologies in job postings, you're going to find that the vast majority is about either producing or using that new technology. So here's um, uh, a last thing that we kind of need for our analysis, which is we need to kind of figure out when did the technology start. It kind of sounds like a silly question, but it's actually kind of hard to have a systematic answer for it. Turns out. There's many different ways of doing it. Here's one way. So what I'm showing here is the time series of mentions of uh, machine learning or AI in earnings conference calls. And you see, you know, it's exploding here. What we're going to say is we're going to take the time series of each mentions of each technology, and we're going to say at the point in time where it's at 10% of its max, that's what we call the year of emergence of techno to technology. And the idea is it captures the year of the commercial breakthrough of the technology. Yeah meaning lots of firms are talking about it. You can do this in different ways, but that's one way of pinpointing a year. And in this case, you know, it's 2015 as the year of emergence of AI as a disruptive technology. So here's a picture for the other technologies. So you get like, you know, production technologies like 3D printing, products like autonomous cars, medical advances, bi-specific antibodies. We have GPS, which is already kind of like on its way out or it's like becoming less disruptive over time. Mobile payments, social networking, Wi-Fi, and so on. Um, first thing I want you to see, is there's a high correlation between the frequency of mentions of these disruptive technologies in earnings calls by firms 
and in job postings. So in other words, when technologies are talked about a lot by executives, that's also when lots and lots of new jobs uh, are going to be relating to this new disruptive technology. So here's kind of the first main finding. And what I want you to see here is that we have this text data. It has many, many dimensions. And all we're doing is aggregating it in different dimensions and running regressions. OK, so the first thing I want to do is I want to measure the average skill associated with a given new technology at a given point in time. The way I will do that is, I, for example, I will take all the job postings that mention smart devices, and I will look at what is the occupation of this job posting. Then there's other data sets that tell you what are kind of typically the education requirements for that occupation. And then you can collapse that back and just have for each technology one time series for, for example, the share of job postings in that technology at that point in time that require a college education. Run a regression of that on the year since the emergence of the technology, and you get a very strongly negative slope. Meaning, as technologies mature, the education requirements of jobs in that technology fall. And this is actually kind of uh, a central question in models of endogenous growth, whether that happens or not. And the answer is resoundingly yes. Um, the second main finding is region broadening, broadening. So for each region, this is like a CBSA, it's like a metro area. We're going to measure the share of jobs in that CBSA that are in that technology. This is going to be the number of shares that uh, the number of, uh, sorry, the share of jobs that uh, are uh, using the disruptive technology divided by the total number of, uh, the to sorry, the share of overall jobs in the country that are related to the technology. Then calculate the coefficient of variation across regions. And then that gives you a measure of dispersion of how concentrated is the use of this new technology across space. OK, so oops, we're, <laughs> we're missing a crucial label here. I'm sorry. So the, the right-hand side variable is here years since emergence of the technology. This is what, hap what happens, I guess, when you PDF a PowerPoint. Um, so OK, what I want you to see, again, in negative and significant slope, so what does, what does this mean? It means the regional concentration of the use of a new technology is falling as the technology matures. Again, this is, the, this is the number of years that have elapsed since the start year of the technology. So as technologies mature, they, they spread across space. Do I have like the pictures? Here's, like, here's a nice way of looking at this. Yeah, so, so the bubbles here are the places, the, 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 the regions, that were responsible for at least 50%, sorry, uh, the, the regions that were responsible for patenting in a given new technology. And I want you to see several things in this plot. The first thing I wanna, just one second, sorry. Um, sorry, the first thing I want you to see is that the places where new technologies are developed that end up being disruptive are very highly concentrated around where Nick is sitting. Okay, so like something like 44%, do I have this down here? Yeah, so 40% of pioneer locations are in California. Then another 20 or some 21% are in the Northeast corridor. This is like extremely highly skewed. These are the places where technologies that later become disruptive for business or mentioned in conference calls emerge, where, they're, where the patents relating to those um, um, uh, technologies are uh, developed. Then over time, you see the spread. This is what I call region broadening. So over time, centered on the pioneer locations, you have this spread across space. And that's what this kind of a uh, half disappearing regression table was supposed to tell you. Any questions so far? Martin. So yeah, I have the following question. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but so far aren't you associating, you know, like a technology to, you know, workers and regions that have a positive effect from it, like those that are using it? 
And so, you know, if you think about solar, for example, solar is great for, you know, X types of workers and X types of locations. But here we're not capturing like negative effects that it may have on like coal workers, for example. Is that is that correct? No, no, no. Right. So so this is a very you're completely right. And there's like a big research question, which is who's getting booted out by the new technology? So far, we have nothing to say about that. And we're much more modest in a sense that what we're measuring is which are where do the jobs, where are the jobs posted? Okay, so these are all about job postings. So where are there open positions that say, we want somebody using or producing this technology, this new disruptive technology. So this is a, a modest, modest step towards trying to answer the kind of big macro question that you're after, which is who actually gets displaced and who gets disrupted by, uh, by these technologies. There are in the paper, a number of kind of interesting tables that we haven't really kind of uh, honestly uh, explored all that much. Uh, but, you know, so again, this is a multi-dimensional thing. What I'm taking here is the location of where the job post, job post, post is posted. Using the same exposure measure, using, you know, my dummy that's one at the job level, if the technology is mentioned in the job ad, I can also look at which occupation at which point in time is that job in. And there are technologies that penetrate very few occupations. And there are other technologies that penetrate many occupations. And there's some hope that kind of that other aggregation of this data will tell you at least which jobs change the most, which occupations change the most as a result of this kind of new technology. But I have nothing kind of definitive to say about that. That's it. Way, it's, yeah. it, it's a great question. You know, it's almost like the reverse of the literature on trade. So. With new technologies, it's easy to measure where the new jobs are. It's much harder to measure the, where the new jobs are lost. As you ask about, the trade story is almost the exact inverse. So it's very easy to measure where the jobs are lost from China. It's much e harder to measure where they're gained from trade. And so, you know, those two literatures are kind of, it feels like have biases in different directions because generally it's like looking under the lamppost where the light is. Economists, I mean, for good reason, focus on what can be measured, but therefore you tend to focus that case. So we focused a lot on job creation from technology, but there's equally, I'm sure a lot of jobs that are destroyed, it's just harder to measure it. So it's really hard as an economist to kind of avoid that. It's probably where measurement really matters because measurement drives a lot of what the policy question is on. And I think it's why the technology policy is focused on all these job creation, the trade policies on job destruction, but I think they're both a bit more balanced, but it's just driven by measurement. Right. But it, yeah, so <laughs> I guess like that's the million dollar question. Like, what's the answer? Like, how, how do you measure the like the the, the flip side of this? Um, I guess I wanted to show you like the region broadening result in some more detail. You can look at it in, for individual technologies and see like you know which technologies spread out across space the most. Yeah, so anything to do with mobiles and smart devices is like pretty strongly downward sloping. As interestingly as machine learning. So this is kind of like just stuff to look at in the paper. I have nothing specific to say about it. Um, let me uh, kind of show you also, and again, this data is online on uh, disruptivetech.net, I think. Is that where it is? If you go to Nick's website or my website, you can follow a link and then that data is online. Um, so, this I'm kind of very excited about because I showed you a map of this before, which is where are the locations where the early patents 10 years before the emergence of the technology are assigned. And you know, so if you look across this, like machine learning, very heavily like San Jose, San Francisco, New York, Seattle, Boston, the ones that you would might think. Fracking, Houston, uh, hybrid vehicles, Detroit, autonomous cars, also like the tech hubs and Detroit. So I think that's kind of an interesting uh, uh, sort of thing to look at. Um, speaking to the question of why do we care? Well, so you'd see here that the places where the early patents were, where basically the technologies were invented are also the places where employment in that technology is focused early on. So if you go for each technology and you look at where do the patents come from, and where is the early employment? You get almost the same answer. 
So if I made this table here, based on purely kind of like job posting data, I would get almost the same answer. So a very high correlation here between the red and the blue, the red dots and the blue circles. Oh, my dear Lord. Okay, so I'm glad I have pictures because they render better on the PDF. So um, yeah, Namrata, you have a question? I have a question about firm size here. Um, if a large firm is innovating on some technology, whether it is medical or whatever, is it also, it's not using it in its establishments across the country? Is it only using it in headquarters? How do we think about uh, this? Yeah. So, this is a great question. And I think that's what's really exciting about this approach is because if this was showing you where is the new technology being used. I, I, we don't really distinguish here between pr produce and use of the use of the technology, but you see that like even, you know, we know that there's lots, like this is the early employment graph. And what this is showing you is that early on, the places where the technologies are invented is also where they're produced and used. And over time, then that kind of attenuates. Um, your question now is, is this true within firm? My guess is yes, but I, we haven't looked at that. So you can run these regressions within firm, like there's nothing keeping you from doing that. Um, there's some tricky questions about like in the burning glass data, figuring out what is a firm. Uh, we have an answer to that. Uh, it's not super simple because basically what you need to do is you need to take the name of the firm and then you need to figure out who belongs to what firm and you need to take out, you know, like, Sometimes the firm name is not mentioned and so forth. It's a bit tricky, but you could in principle look at within firm where are even, you know, yeah. So where are the new tech, how are, how are they spreading within technology? What I can show you, tell you, and I'm, I'm not sure if I have this here. Yeah, I, I don't have it here, but what, what I, so what we have done is you can look at uh, like very specific examples. So look at like GM and Ford and, and jobs relating to autonomous cars and self-driving stuff. And you see that the high, like basically both GM and Ford after the emergence of autonomous cars as, an, uh, uh, as, a, as a technology shift high skill jobs in that technology to the places where the technology was invented. And specifically in that example, that means they create hundreds of jobs in Silicon Valley that were not there before in that firm. Yeah, so I think there's ex exciting things to be done, but like we've only kind of like looked at kind of very basic stuff so far. You have a working theory of why this is? Is there returns to scale on using new technology in a group um, or sort of why the dispersion is, is the way you're observing it? I, I might have to consult my lawyer. I'm not sure. What do you mean? Namato, you mean why um why they're locally concentrated and move out over time? So if I if I'm if I have a task-based kind of model in my head and you know I'm working on a computer, uh, I'm a coder sitting in Boston, even though the technology is uh, invented in Silicon Valley, why this spatial concentration of people who are allowed to work on a technology even within a large firm? Well, okay, so just to chat, I wasn't. I interpreted your question slightly differently. So just to make sure, it, the job ad just has the location of where you're working. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it's General Electric, General Electric's across the country, but it would say like G, GE Bakersfield, California, and that's what we're using. So the upside of the job ads is because you need to know where to report to work. It's true. There's very few working from home jobs that are fully remote, but that's so rare that basically. So that's why that's the useful thing on it. We have the location. So the firm thing isn't that critical for us. It's primarily where it is. Now, I think if your question is, uh, take Apple. Apple has its labs, uh, obviously, for the cell phone in Silicon Valley. And, you know, this thing, we all carry these things now. But in 2007, they launched it. They were working it for three, four, five years beforehand. And those engineers are all in Silicon Valley. So not surprisingly, early on around the launch of the cell, of the whatever PDA, like the smartphone, all of the engineering jobs tended to be around Silicon Valley. Now, as the uh, smartphone takes off, you get a lot of more low-skilled jobs that are like selling them in AT&T and Verizon shops across the country. 
but it's still the case that a lot of Apple labs and research and people making apps for the phone are still located in Silicon Valley. So maybe I mean, if I understood the question correctly, basically the high school jobs stay locally because they're the labs and researchers and these people tend to cluster. As Tarek showed like 40% of Silicon Valley, 20% are in Boston. I mean, that's, two th it's, that's kind of astounding. That's the most striking thing. Two thirds of big innovative creations in the US over the last 30 years have come from two small regions, Silicon Valley and Boston. And that's basically, it. it's kind of amazing. But it's not that amazing if you read the news and think, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Most big deals do come from there. There are some like fracking that don't, but most of the rest are from there. And those high skilled jobs tend to stick there and the low skilled jobs move out pretty fast. So that's this picture here. So this is the geographic concentration, like just the same regression I showed you earlier, just run separately for high skill and low school jobs. And you see here, the high school jobs have a much slope, uh, um, flatter slope, meaning they, they, they tend to stick around uh, where they were initially, which is where the technology was invented, whereas the low skill stuff is much faster to spread around. So, so, so the, the, um, the consequence of this is that the pioneer locations where the technology was invented have a long-term advantage in high, in high skill employment in that technology. So uh, again, uh, this is like, five minutes left. Yeah. So I'm I'm going to wrap up now. So 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 the so this is like uh, again a terribly butchered um, uh, uh, table. But what this is supposed to show is uh, that um, is that there's very high persistence in uh, in um, uh, in high skill jobs. They tend to tend to stick around uh, the uh, locations where the technology originated. You see here, like the spread. This is what you showed. So showed that we what you saw graphically. There's a much lower kind of gradient in how high skill jobs spread than low skill jobs spread. So, and the way to think about this, uh, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. So, this is like a half life of 20 years for low skill jobs uh, in the coefficient of variation, uh, and uh, 40 years for high skill jobs. All right, so I've already mentioned that part of this persistent advantage of pioneer locations is due to rehoming, of where established firms shift jobs to pioneer locations after the emergence of the technology, where autonomous cars is the one example that we've worked out in the paper. Um, pioneer locations are more likely to arise in urban areas with universities and an educated population, which is just a function of somebody needs to invent something in order for their, that invention to become disruptive later on. Um, there, you can also kind of look at this across other dimensions that are interesting, like the diffusion of technologies across firms and industries and occupations. I've mentioned this already. Um, maybe the, um, the in most interesting finding there is that firms that originally developed a technology retain a, retain a persistent advantage in hiring in that technology uh, for with a half-life of about 11 years. So that means if you've invented something that becomes disruptive, you also tend to like post more jobs in that technology for a long period of time. So the data here is on this website, techdiffusion.net. We've tried to kind of basically post the most granular uh, version of this data possible. Um, so you can aggregate it in a variety of different ways and maybe kind of figure some stuff out that we, uh, that we haven't looked at at all. 